Good evening. My name is Brian Joseph Lee. I am the director of Public Forum and welcome back to Creative Activism, a day of art, ideas, and action. I am thrilled to round out this full day of workshops, panel discussions, and conversations with an interview with noted playwright and MacArthur Genius Grant Fellow, Dominique Marisa. This session is co-broadcast with our friends at WNYC's Green Space. It's a fantastic conversation. I hope you enjoy. Hi everybody, Allison Stewart here, and we are closing out this creative activism day with an in-depth interview with Dominique Moriso. She of course is an award-winning playwright and MacArthur Genius Fellow, and one of the few black women to be produced on Broadway. If you're not familiar with her work, I know you are, but I'm gonna let you know some of the plays. She has written The Detroit Project, as well as Pipeline, Sunset Baby, Blood at the Root, and Follow Me to Nellie's. And of course, she was nominated for a Tony Award for Ain't Too Proud to Beg, which of course was the book for the Temptations musical on Broadway. And for folks of the public, she was part of the public's emerging writers group. Dominique, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm going to offer a correction that you said something that everybody says. It's, it's called Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. And everybody always says Ain't Too Proud to Beg, of course, because that's the name of the song. Uh, but I always, I hear it. It's always like, yeah, that, that was our fault. That was my fault for titling this play Ain't Too Proud. But you <laughs> so, did it for a reason. And it's so I did it for a reason. because I knew that. Because I watched it <laughs> with you and I, I told myself, I'm not going to say it. And then it rolled People can't help it. It's, I know it's my fault. And you blame me, please, and not yourself. <laughs> I want to take you all the way back. Why did you start writing? Like when you were when you were first first writing, even as a kid, why did you start writing? Uh, you know, well, because I I was a reader. Um, I was an avid reader, and my mother read stories to me um, when I was young. When I would go to bed, you know, and or just. Now, when I would go to bed, she was a teacher. She was a third grade teacher most of my life. And so um, she's a really good storyteller. And I fell in love with stories. Um, and so I think, one, I became a writer because I, my imagination, uh, I had a very big imagination. And writing was the place to, to hold it, you know. Um, and, I, and I think over time, my relationship to writing has changed and become many things you know like like all writers writing is also your therapy you know but it is um for me it is a way to wrestle with the world with my questions that i have about the world that i'm in um it's the space that can hold my most radical ideas uh and not judge me for them and so i i seek writing to 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 find to find access to my boldest self when in your life your young life did you realize I have to do this for the rest of my life? Like I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. You know, it's funny. I was a kid who wrote, you know, and I, uh, I've said this a hundred thousand times, but I used to have these cabbage patch dolls. <laughs> and, um, and so I was obsessed with my cabbage patch dolls. And so when I would write, I would write my cabbage patch dolls into my stories. <laughs> so I had these, um, I had like a trilogy, not even, well, it was more than a trilogy. I don't even know how many versions of the Cabbage Patch Kid mysteries I wrote, but I had several Cabbage Patch Kid mysteries and, uh, and I would put them in the craziest situations. I mean, they were finding a kidnapped children and bringing them back to their parents, you know, <laughs> they were like, they were doing a lot of things. Um, and so I, I fell in love with writing very early. And when my classmates, you know, I, would pass, I called myself the story pusher. Mm -hmm. When I passed my little, you know, little booklets around, my little paper booklets that I would staple, you know, to my classmates um, to read the Cabbage Patch Mysteries. And the way that they responded to it was like, oh, my God, what's, what else is going to happen? What, you know, like, what, when's the new Cabbage Patch Mystery coming? I was like, oh, OK, I got something for you, you know, and I'm going to go back and write another one. And so um, I, that's when I fell in love with it. And I figured, oh, this is what I want to do. And I told my mother, you know, when I was young, that I want to be a writer, an actress, and a child psychologist. Those were my three things that I thought I wanted to be. <laughs> and she was always like, good, because you're going to need a backup plan. And I was like, yeah, child psychology will be my backup plan <laughs> for, like, acting and writing. Thanks. You know, this is like at, like, six <laughs> that I was talking like oh. this. You know, yeah. 
You know, I think we know what we want, who we are when we're that age. Like if you go back and look at things you've asked for for Christmas, those Christmas lists yep. or letters and notes you wrote to your friends, that's, that's it's right. hard when you're a little kid. That's right. I just had to, I had to call my mother recently uh, in some, I, I asked her some questions about oh, who I used to be because I was like, I feel like, you know, I do a lot of fighting in, in, in inside of my industry and outside of my industry in the world. Mm-hmm. I just do a lot of advocating. And I was like, you know, um, with that, you can get a little burnout and a little sense of fatigue, mm-hmm. you know, and I called her to say, was I always, you know, am I like, I need to know if fighting is in my DNA and what that means, you know, because I, I don't, I think sometimes I am perceived to be a more tough, you know, or whatever than I actually feel like I am, you know? Um, and, uh, and so I said, was I, I don't remember feeling like I was tough as a kid. I remember feeling like I was a lot of things, very emotional and sensitive. Um, and my mom said, you were, you were a tough cookie. And I was like, what I know? <laughs> you know? And she's like, yeah, you're like your dad. Cause my dad was very activist. Uh, focused and oriented mm-hmm. and and she says you're like your dad you're tough on the outside and soft on the inside and I was like okay yeah that that does sound like me and so that sounds like that sounds like who I've always been and who better to tell you who you are than your mother you know so I, that's, I called her to find that out because I felt like I need to know like where I'm at mm-hmm. in my trajectory of my own self <laughs> you know like so that I can get a sense of um, a balance for myself now what did you learn about activism from your dad? You know, everything. I mean, I, funny enough, my father, he passed away in February um, of this year. Wow. And I've been rediscovering myself through his, through writings of his, you know, I have his hard drive where he, he journaled a lot. And I found, I found lots of things. Um, once I found an article that he wrote about workers' rights, mm-hmm. um, the headline of the article that my father wrote, uh, for a local union in Detroit, it said, workers are the power in this country. And everything he's writing about in that article, whether it's about um, Nicaraguan fishermen <laughs> and, and our global impact on them, you know, it, wh- whatever he's talking about, you know, he's talking about voting and, and why he feels like there needs to be a new emergence between Democrat and Republican. He feels like there needs to be something more focused on working people. Um, like he's just, the thing that he's saying, I was like, oh my God, it sounds like now. And he wrote it in like 1983. You know, and then I literally just found a letter he wrote. Um, I don't know why this is on my computer. He probably gave it to me to print or something. And um, it's a letter that he was writing to his church uh, and to whomever, to potential donors of a Haitian orphan that he took under his wing. My father's Haitian. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he would go back to Haiti with um, health clinics, with doctors, and he would translate for them to serve like the most rural parts of Haiti, you know, and uh, he met an orphan there and wanted to help put this orphan through medical school. Mm-hmm. And um, and so he, he, he I mean, I literally just found this two days ago and he, he was writing this letter. It, all this. He's very my father's very intellectual, you know, <laughs> so it's like all this intellectual jargon, you know, and then it gets to this part where he's like, and in case giving to this man's education isn't enough to, to compel you to give. Uh, perhaps I can appeal to your revolutionary spirit. <laughs> and then he starts talking about how revolutionary an act it is to invest in someone like this man in this part of Haiti and the, 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 a place where he's relegated to being poor and society is trying to make sure he's, he, he stays that way. You know, and I was just like, the things that he, the things that he was writing, I was like, Oh my God. Like, Dude, I'm this day. I'm this dude's daughter, if ever anything. <laughs> you know, like this is just like I feel like this must have seeped into my brain in ways that I did not, I was not aware of. This is like what subconscious truly means. I think, you know. Well, how will will all of this information will this wind up in your work? You know, it already has, and it will continue to. Um, my place, Sunset Baby, is very inspired by my father in a lot of ways. I mean, we had as much as we. We got close in my, you know, adulthood. We had a, you know, a very. My father and I are just alike, and it took me a long time to be able to say that, <laughs> you know. So we're we're like this, you know. And I had a I had a fraught relationship with him growing up. Um, and my play Sunset Baby is dealing with fraught relationship between a father and a daughter. It was, it's way more fraught than me and my father, but it's very fraught, and uh, but a revolutionary father. 
and um, and a lot of the revolutionary ideas that the father in the play had, and also the fact that he recorded himself sharing his revolutionary ideas. My father did that. One of the best things my father has left us in his aftermath is his videos. Um, he would record himself all the time. Uh, I have a video of him right now that I had found right before I wrote my play, Sunset Baby. I have a video of my father uh, talking about the idea of himself running for city council or running for Congress. I think it was running for Congress. And he's just talking about the ways in which the political body works and how he believes in revolution. <laughs> and it was just like, and when I saw it, I was like, when I saw it years ago, uh, I got, you know, watching my a, a video of my father somehow made me feel closer to him than ever in person. He was like, you know, when somebody, you like, when you watch, like, when somebody scratches their head or it's like, you know, does this, you know, like, his, his, his smallest gestures became really large to me. And I was like, wow, like, my father, I'm like, I get, I'm knowing him way more intimately. It was way more intimate seeing him on video. Uh, and I got to understand his political mind mm -hmm. and also his his human fragility. And I, and I captured that in my play, Sunset Baby. I used some of those same videos, uh, you know, sort of borrow from his, that inspiration to use um, in my play where a father is talking to his daughter through video. You've described your father's sense of activism. How do you describe your activism? Uh, you know, progressing. <laughs> I, I, I feel like my activism, my sense of activism is progressing um, for myself. It has shifted. It, uh, you know, it used to be that I thought um, having socially conscious art was activism, you know, and then there was a time when I felt like, oh, no, I'm not a real activist. The real activists are out there on the ground and they're you know, they're the humanitarians going, you know, the third world countries and negotiating peace talks and they're, they're doing those things. I'm not that. So I'm just an activist minded artist, you know, so then I would call myself activist minded. <laughs> and then I and then I started to um, my work started to need inside of the field that I work within. I've, I've had to advocate and fight and do a lot of pushing to to, to try to. Um, push my industry forward, you know, through my own work and in the presentation of my work. If my work's going to be on this stage, it needs to be like this. We need to open up the doors to audiences like this. We need to um, change the way leadership looks like this, you know. And in my pushing inside of my own field and uh, and pushing for others and in my pushing for things on the street and in my marching and in my writing activist letters to governors long before you could do it by clicking a button, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and when I just hand, like literally write and mail letters to governors or emails, you know, I realize um, I've come full circle with my definition of myself as an activist. And so now I am, I'm fully, not only am I fully committed to the calling myself an activist, but I'm fully committed to being an activist, particularly within my field, you know? Um, I'm fully committed to not just doing it on the page, but pushing for it in real, real life. I'm standing up for the things that I believe in, um, in ways in which I am holding real life people accountable, uh, including myself, mm -hmm. for uh, the harm that we can or cannot cause to society. I was interviewing Billy Porter last night. And I asked him, what do the gatekeepers need to know? The predominantly white gatekeepers need to know. And he said this, the caste system has created a space where we as people of color are always on the bottom. We as the outsiders have to be able to be in positions of power so that we can usher in a different type of storytelling based on our history. We need to become the gatekeepers. What do you think is the biggest obstacle to people of color becoming gatekeepers? Uh, well, I think it's a few things. I think one of the biggest obstacles for that, uh, for, uh, for people of color becoming gatekeepers is, is, is one is on the side of white supremacist structure, not wanting to let go of its power and how many people don't, are not aware that they are upholding white supremacist structure in our society. And that looks like white people, that looks like people of color, all holding up white supremacy. Right. That looks like white people who are afraid to um, transition power and who are who are unwilling to step down from power. 
in order to, and who are also unwilling to cultivate power and leadership um, in others who don't look like them, you know? But it is also, um, it also looks like fear of, of white people having to be in, under the authority of people of color. You know, I think in this country, we are very used to white authority, you know? And 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 in white authority, be feeling like an ally. I will. I ha I want the power to be on my terms of how I support people of color instead of being on people of color's terms. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a very different thing, you know. Um, and so I so I say that that's that's one barrier. And then the other barrier is um, I think people of color not recognizing how much we hold a white supremacist structure, how much we do not how much we seek validation from that structure. And not just validation, like, you know, like award or, you know, but all, that too, but also we seek validation from it economically. Um, we, we, we somehow have, have been obedient to the thinking in, in many ways that white supremacists, that we have been obedient to white supremacy, that somehow, um, something that comes through that gaze or something that comes through that um that offering is is better and can lead us to having the things that we want so we do a less investing in ourselves um and in our own ideas and I, that's evidence i mean i hate to say this this way but it's also evidence and it's like we always want to do the the black version of a white something you know, let's all get together and do the black version of this white show, of this white TV show, of this white play. And um, as if to say that, you know, we want to prove that we can be just as good actors by doing, you know, this white work as well. When there is a, a wealth of work within um, our all of our very cultural canons. And we, you don't see other people doing that, you know? So there's, even when we think that we're being subversive or we're going, we're gonna be revolutionary, we're gonna make this all black. Why? <laughs> Why are we doing that? Or we're gonna make this, we're gonna put an all Latinx cast in our town. Or you could just, you know, do some work that was written with their intention in the first place, you know? But that we wanna somehow um, always show that we are, in, in, in literature, I think, in literary work, and in theater, that to me is one of the places where white intellectual supremacy is held up the most. It is held up in theater and in literature, you know? And so I don't think we're gonna change it in systems of economics or anything else if we don't change it in the whole entire um, mental, the mentality that we're creating through the art and the images that art creates, you know? And so if we don't shift it in the art, we're not gonna shift it in the rest of the culture. Dominique, what was a time in your career that you hit an obstacle and you figured out a workaround? Okay, uh, many <laughs> times. I mean, I don't know. I think I'm constantly figuring out workarounds. I, mm -hmm. I was just figuring out, I, I literally was just figuring out a workaround today, calling some of my very powerful friends in the business who've been there before me and going, okay, how do I, how do I need to be thinking about this? Um, but I, you know, I think that I also, when I, I'll tell you that I've hit roadblocks of, um, my work being not received in the way that I would have liked, you know, critically, you know, um, or my work not being received, you know, in the awarding circuit or, um, you know, and I, I have just unplugged from, I have learned, you know, to unplug from, uh, being an artist, being predicated on approval, you know? So like my ability to tell stories and be prolific in telling stories is um, that I have the power to do that and no one has the power to give me that. So it's a, my mental shifting is the biggest way. Th those are the biggest hurdles for me. And I'm the only one who can really undo those hurdles, you know? Um, so I'm the only one who can remove those hurdles because I'm the only one who is obedient to that. You know, so if I can, if I, if, if someone says this is how you do something and I don't, I don't kinesthetically agree, you know, then I have to, I have to shift my brain at feeling that I have to be obedient to the way that they say this has to happen. And I think that I would like to see culturally us have a, a mental shift on thinking that there's only one way 
that that there's only one way to do something. I, I literally had this thought. I'm just say this. I had this thought the other day. You know, I was um working on a project with artists. You know, and uh, the producers of this project. You know, I, and the director. And I think about them, and I go, Oh, I'm not supposed to talk to, directly to the artists. You know, I'm supposed to. I shouldn't betray the director and the producers. I'm supposed to uphold like some covenant of talking only to the directors and the producers, you know? Um, and then I go, why am I, why? Who mm -hmm. made that rule? Why am I not going to the people that will be directly impacted? Who is that serving? Oh, it serves the power structure. It doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve me to, to, to not talk down, to only talk up. Like that doesn't serve me. That only serves people in the positions of power to stay in those very dominant positions of power. If we are truly trying to, um, uh, shift power and we have to think about answering to the people and not always answering to the uh, the gatekeepers. You're part of a small cohort, unfortunately, a small cohort of women who've been produced on Broadway, Black women who've been produced on Broadway, Lynn Nottage, Kadori Hall, Latina Turner musicals, you wrote the book for that, um, yeah. and Pea Valley, which is, that's not Broadway, but that's just so yeah. good. But it's, um, fast, it's, it's fabulous enough to mention. It's <laughs> it's so good. Good. Yeah. Uh, what is, I know this is sort of a simplistic question. What is one thing that could change that would open the doors for black women playwrights to get their work on Broadway? And I'm talking magic wand time. I'm, you know, not realistic. Uh, I think more, um, so first of all, there are black producers on Broadway. Um, and then there's also the Broadway League that should be opening its ranks, you know. And I, I, I know that there are there's there's a start to that, and I think that they have more to do, <laughs> you know. But there's also, um, and I think black producers need. Uh, I wanted to say have a seat at the table, but that's that. There's something infantilizing about that that I don't like. I I I'd rather say that black producers. Um, and, and their relationships to theater owners need to, theater owners should be investing in opening their doors to black theater producers, right? To get shows um, on not only the great white way, but we kind of have to get off of just the great white way and move uptown, you know? Like the Apollo Theater has a really amazing space and they're opening up two new theater spaces. I think we have to get our brains away from like Broadway being the only model um, and that that's a model. And it's, it, you know, and there's more models, right? And um, and so I'd like to see, I think the idea of more black women getting produced, not just on Broadway, but just getting produced uh, means more black producing leadership and that those producers, uh, when they bring their money, when they raise their money and their capital that they're engaged with, you know, because that's also a thing where some, a lot of black producers are like the, the, the third or fourth tier producer on a show. So their 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 voice and their power is muted mm -hmm. in comparison, you know, to some of their the larger producers. And so I think that there needs to be they need to be the lead producers on commercially produced shows um, and have a voice that counts. And artists need to participate and be producers inside of their shows because a lot of times, you know, it's like you always have you have I always say that you always have a bunch of business people or a bunch of, you know, people who are about capital, you know, making decisions over the bodies of the creatives. And that should not be, the, that's, that's, a, that's an imbalance of power. If artists are, at the, are in the room, if the work is gonna be out there in the world, if you're basically making your money off of the talents of, of these artists and they need to be, they have their power positions at that table, and not just a seat at the table, but they need to have a voice at that table and, um, and be able to impact decisions around their own creative work. And so that to me will help open the door for more, not just more black women writers, but just more writers of color in general. I mean, you know, we have like a few in each category, you know, you have like a couple of black women Broadway writers, you know, and Broadway to me is not um, a definer for me. I'm like, I'm a woman on Broadway. I'm not like a Broadway person. Mm -hmm. I'm not like a Broadway playwright. I'm a playwright who's worked on Broadway, you know? Um, and so, I think one getting that out of our head, but also where are our Latinx women writers that we are, you know, lifting up? Where are our Native American women writers? You know, like I think that there's a there's muted voices of color all across our field that I think we need to be amplifying. 
it's hard to separate this. If we can separate the horror of the pandemic and we shouldn't forget it, but I just want, just for the sake of this conversation, is there something that it can come out of this pandemic, how it has disrupted systems that could be beneficial down the road, that could really help create the kind of change you're talking about? I think so. I think so. I mean, I'm not somebody who, funny enough, I've been listening to Octavia Butler's um, Parable of the Sower on mm -hmm. Audible. And it, that is the story of now, like nothing else I've read. <laughs> I mean, frighteningly so, frighteningly so. And her book was about the future and we are upon the future that she was writing about. She was writing about 2024. <laughs> and it's like 2020. And when I read this book in like 2010, it scared me because I was like, wow, that could happen. And now we're in 2020 and it's, we're closer to her prophecy. So it, it's really it's really terrifying. But I, I bring her up because um, one of the things that comes up in Parable of the Sower is this idea of not being in denial about the conditions that we're in. Mm -hmm. And instead of all, you know, and so there's a young girl who's sort of like the leader of the book. She's a she's a free thinker. She's 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 renegotiating her relationship with the religion that she's been raised in. She's having a different she's creating her own religion, which is already like taboo, you know, and she's um, changing her thinking about what they're going to need to do socially, you know, and uh, and no one is willing to get on board with her uh, because what she says is terrifying. Right. Like, like she's like, we need to have emergency packs and we need to be learning how to garden and we need, to, you know, things that we need to be thinking about. And, you know, and she'll say, like, we need to, you know, have a, a exit strategy of how we're going to when 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 we're invaded upon, because we will be what we're going to do and how we're going to move. And every time she brings it up to like her friends and her peers are like, they're like, or things will go back to normal. That was the point. Right. Things will society will go back to normal. She said, I don't think that it will go back to normal. And I want to be, and, and I love this line. She says, I intend to survive. So I'm not going to, I can't sit in here and, and be in this place of denial with you. So I say that to say, I think that to me, this moment of this pandemic is not like, let's just hurry up. Let's just hold ourselves for the impact and then open our eyes when it's over and we can go back to normal. I don't think that's going to happen. I think very much like in Parable of the Soul, we are going to have to imagine a new thing and we're going to have to watch some stuff tumble and crumble and to the ground and it's going to be terrifying it's terrifying to say that to people so then we want to stop you from being negative <laughs> and then we don't then we do nothing and i think that's the mentality that got us into where we are as a country right now that idea of like let's just close our eyes and go get back to the good old days and then some of these good old days were not good <laughs> for for a lot of people you know for the majority of people the good old days were not good so that's not something to go back to. And I think that it's in this moment that we have an opportunity to go, well, if it's going to crumble, out of the crumbling, we, we stop there, most of us, and we, we, we stay in that space of it's crumbled. I don't know what to do. And we get crippled in our fear. And I think out of crumbling comes building, right? And so we can't be afraid to go through the crumble to get to the building. And we have to have vision, longer vision, about what we want to build. So this is a great moment because I do think we are going to build a new. And I always say, you know, in the first, well, I think we're in a second civil rights movement in our country. And out of the first civil rights movement came the emergence of uh, all these black theaters emerging around the country and on in Harlem, you know, there was a black arts movement and an explosion of a new way of thinking and a new idea and new institutions and organizations to come with it. And I think this is that moment again, where we will see. And then also out of that came Latinx theaters emerging around the country and Native American theaters emerging around the country. Out of this movement, we will see that happen again, you know? And I think that um, rather than getting afraid of it, I think we need to get our, my, our imaginations need to open back up. And that's why I started with saying as a kid, I had a strong imagination. And inside of that imagination, I could conceive of my like amazing possibilities for myself. And it's only, I, I didn't have a no in my brain to say that that wasn't gonna happen. You know, as I got older, people tell you no, and I started to believe them, but then out of myself, I did not have a no button. My, the answer was yes every time I came up with something, you know? And so I think we have to get back to that, our imagination, 
when I talk to some of my um, on the ground activist friends who are out here, you know, in Minneapolis, who are like leaders of organizations and, and leaders of movements, and, we and they talk about, you know, I have one friend talk to me about defunding the police. Her name is Sydney Herodin. Um, and she's a very, she's an on the ground artist in Minneapolis and activist. And she, and I said, can you talk me through, you know, it's like someone like my mother or that's a really hard concept for like the average everyday person, even the ones who want to see policing stop, you know, this, uh, this police violence stop. Mm -hmm. That's a hard one for them to get their heads around. And she said the word imagination. What can we imagine in place of that? Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, that's what's, that's the thing. That's the thing that's hard. Change means that we have to tap into our imagination. And um, and most of our imaginations have been beaten out of us, you know? And so I do think it's the job of the artist to help society get back in touch with its imagination. It's interesting you said you went back to a child because I have a friend who's got a small business and he's doing okay. And I said, what's going on? How are you doing this? And he said, three things, back to basics, don't be a snob, and look for opportunity. Yeah. And that is how, and he's a creative person. He's been able to sort of rethink, you know, yeah. like I, the fabulous life is gone, but That's I'm right. doing what I love to do again. And I'm looking for other ways to do it. That's right. And this is the time to invent. Innovation comes from imagination, creativity. That is how we have innovation. And this is the time for innovation. So I just, I'm, I, I, I encourage everyone get, get, Start imagining the greatest things you can, like get back in touch with yourself, you know, um, and this is the time to do that while you also uh, shift your thinking, you know, open your minds up, you know, shift your thinking and be unafraid instead of sitting still and, and be in paralysis from fear, you know, find a way to be active in your fear, find a way to look your fear in the face and walk right into it <laughs> instead of. I'm afraid so I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go, I'm going to try to go. You can't go around fear. It's going to find you. <laughs> I know you tried to go, you tried to make a left turn. Fear, fear knows that route. Fear is the GPS, to be clear. <laughs> you know, fear is the GPS. It's already inside your system and it knows all the rerouting. You know, you will get there. You're going to have to face it somewhere or another. So um, I'd rather, I intend, I intend as an artist and as a, as a woman to survive. And so I'm going to face it. That's such a beautiful place to end. Dominique yeah. Morisot, thank you so much for being with us. You were inspiring. Can go oh, out and be you. imaginative right now. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you, thank you. I mean, I, I I, keep discovering stuff, you know, from my father and I realize oh, I am my father's daughter and I get to carry on the torch of his revolutionary dream. And that's, I'm gonna do it, you know? Like if he, I, I feel very purpose in that. It gives me nothing but peace. And 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 frankly, I don't know, somehow losing my father mm -hmm. and feeling tasked with his, to con carry on his vision for the world, I feel it, it gives me fearlessness in that way. Maybe whoever needed to hear this tonight is hearing it. I hope so. And then keep going forward. That's what we hope. I hope so. Dominique, take care of yourself. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. You too, Allison. Thank you for the interview. That was fantastic. Dominique, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering the call, for joining us today and sharing your story. Well, folks, we've had a full day of workshops, panel conversations, interviews, discussions, all meant to help you harness your power for change. We sat with three queer black feminists to understand what it means to find your political home. We were able to join with organizations like Four Freedoms and the Brennan Center to find creative ways for change making in 2020 and beyond, and to inform ourselves about how to show up for this election. And we sat with some noted authors, poets, playwrights, and thinkers to really get an in-depth view as to what it means to be a creative in this day and age. I hope that each of you takes the inspiration that you found today and find a real way to mobilize in your community, to act, to learn, to grow. We are less than six weeks until the 2020 election. But the one thing we do know is that this contentious world doesn't begin or end on November 3rd. 
and the organizing that we do, that we continue to do, will follow far beyond this next election. I wish you all the best. Thank you for joining us. And on behalf of the Public Forum team, thank you to everyone at the Public Theater who had a hand in supporting today's summit. Take care.